The night of February 11th, the Egyptian dictatorship of Hosni Mubarak was falling. More than 100,000 people filled Cairo's Tahrir Square in wild celebration. Among those in the crowd was our 60 Minutes colleague, correspondent Laura Logan. Laura, a native of South Africa, is an experienced war reporter, but Tahrir Square became her most hazardous assignment. During the revolution, dozens of reporters were assaulted, often by agents of the regime. The night of the 11th, a mob turned on Laura and her 60 Minutes team and singled her out in a violent sexual assault. Since then, Laura has been recuperating with her husband and two children. Now, she's returning to work, and she's decided to tell the story of what happened just once here on our broadcast. She's speaking out, she tells us, to add her voice to those who confront sexual violence, to break what she calls the code of silence. Laura Logan arrived in Cairo at a moment of triumph for Egypt. She didn't imagine in the hours before midnight she would be fighting for her life. The story will continue in a moment. When we drove from the airport into Cairo that night, moments after Mubarak had stepped down, it was unbelievable. It was like unleashing a champagne cork. On Egypt. I'm anxious to get to the square. I got to be there because this is a moment in history that you don't want to miss. What does it look like? It looks like a party. It's a roar of sound because everyone's so excited and they're singing songs of the revolution and they're shouting slogans. And everybody's you know, very physical, so you're being jostled and pushed, and sometimes people get closer, and my guys are very protective, as you know, they want to keep people at bay. It was impossible not to get caught up in the moment, which was a real moment of celebration. Tell me about your team. Our producer um, was Max McClellan. My cameraman was Richard Butler. Baja works for us. We had a local fixer, Baja, whose job was to bridge the divide for us as foreigners. We had uh, two Egyptian drivers with us who were purely there to act as security and bodyguards. And then we had a security person, Ray, who's done security all over the world. This is what these people have been waiting for. They came here day after day. This is about freedom. She reported without a hint of trouble for more than an hour. And what happened then? Our camera battery went down. <laughs> and we had to stop for a moment. And suddenly, Baha looks at me and says, we've got to get out of here. Baha is not happy here. He's Egyptian, he speaks Arabic, and he can hear what the crowd is saying. Yes. He understands what no one else in the crew understands. That's right. And I was told later that um, they were saying, let's take her pants off. And it's like suddenly, before I even know what's happening, I feel hands grabbing my breasts, grabbing my crutch, grabbing me from behind. I mean, it, and it, it's, it's not, you know, one person and then it stops. It's like one person and another person and another person. And I know Ray is right there and he's grabbing at me and screaming, Lara, hold on to me, hold on to me. As she was pulled into the frenzy, the camera recorded her shout. Stop! And I'm screaming, thinking, if I scream, if they know, they're going to stop. You know, someone's going to stop them or they're going to stop themselves because this is wrong. And... It was the opposite. Is the more I screamed, it turned them into it, it turned them into a frenzy. Someone in the crowd shouted say, that she was an Israeli, a Jew. A Jew. Neither is true, but to the mob, it right. was a match to gasoline. Yes. The it's savage assault turned into a murderous hatred. fury. I have one arm on Ray. I've lost the fixer. I've lost the drivers. I've lost everybody except him, and I feel them tearing at my clothing. I think my shirt, my sweater was torn off completely. My shirt was around my neck. Um, I felt the moment that my bra tore, they tore the metal uh, clips of my bra. They tore those open. And I felt that because the air, I felt the air on my chest, on my skin. And uh, I felt them tear out. They literally just tore my pants to shreds. And then I felt 
um, my underwear go. And I remember looking up when, when my clothes gave way, I remember looking up and seeing them taking pictures with their cell phones, the flashes of their cell phone cameras. Ray reported that he found himself with the sleeve of your jacket in his hand. It had been completely ripped from the rest of the jacket. I felt at that moment that Ray was my only hope of survival. You know, he, he was looking at me and I could see his face and we had a sea of people between us, obviously tearing at both of us, beating us. I didn't, I didn't even know that they were beating me with um, flagpoles and sticks and things because I couldn't even feel that because I think of the, of the sexual assault was all I could feel, was their hands raping me over and over and over again. Raping you with their hands? Yeah. Non-stop? No, from the front, from the back. And um, I didn't know if I could hold on to Ray. I'm holding on to him. I didn't want to let go of him. I, th I, thought, I thought I was going to die if I lost hold of him. But in that moment, <laughs> Ray, a former him. Special Forces soldier, was torn away. When I lost Ray, I thought that was the end. It was like all the adrenaline left my body. Because I knew in his face, when he lost me, he thought he'd, I was going to die. That they were tearing my body in every direction at this point, tearing my muscles. And they were trying to tear off chunks of my scalp. They had my head in different directions. Pulling at your hair. Oh yeah, and not, not trying to pull out my hair, holding big wads of it, trying to, literally trying to tear my scalp off my skull. And I thought, uh, when I thought, I'm going to die here. And my next thought was, I can't believe I just, I just let them kill me. That that was, that was as much fight as I had, that I just gave in. And I gave up on my children so easily. How could you do that? Your daughter and your son are one and two years old. I had to fight for them. And that's when I said, OK, it's about staying alive now. I have to just surrender to the sexual assault. The, what more can they do now? They're inside you, everywhere. So the only thing to fight for, left to fight for, was my life. It was a fight she endured about 25 minutes. I, there was no doubt in my mind that I was in the process of dying. I thought, not only am I going to die here, but it's going to be just a torturous death that's going to go on forever and ever and ever. Laura was dragged along by the mob until they were stopped by a fence. At that spot, a group of Egyptian women were camped out. And I, I almost fell into um, the lap of this woman on the ground who was head to toe in black. Just her eyes, I remember. Just her eyes, I could see. Wearing a shador. Yes. And she put her arms around me. And, uh, oh my God, I can't tell you what that moment was like for me. I wasn't safe yet because the mob was still trying to get at me. But now it wasn't just about me anymore. It was about their women. And that was what saved me, I think. Um, the women kind of closed ranks around me. And I remember one or two, maybe three men standing with them and throwing, the women were throwing water on the crowd and they were pouring water over me because I, I couldn't breathe, you know, I was, I was rasping. By this time, her team had convinced a group of soldiers to go in after her. Finally, finally, some soldiers fought their way through the crowd with batons, beating the mob back. And, um, and that was the moment I thought, I have a chance to get out of here alive. And I grabbed the first soldier and I did not let him go. Boy, I, did, I was not letting go of him and I'm screaming and hysterical. I'm like a wild thing at this point. I mean, you imagine my hair is everywhere because they've tried to, to tear my scalp to pieces. I, my clothes are shredded. I'm filthy, black with dirt from going down into the filth. The soldiers took you out of there? That one soldier that I was holding on to, he threw me over his back and, uh, and they still had to beat the mob back to get through it, back to the tank where they had more soldiers. What happened in that moment when you first were reunited with the rest of the crew? I remember Max 
going down on his knees in front of me, and he said, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. By the time producer Max McClellan saw Laura, she was in the arms of one of the drivers, dangling as if her legs were broken. She looked uh, like a rag doll. She looked completely limp. She looked like someone who was uh, physically, emotionally, and mentally spent, uh, overwhelmed. She had the soldiers drove Laura and her 60 Minutes team back to their hotel where a doctor examined her. Uh, she was basically uh, sore everywhere, head to toe. She, it was like she had been through some sort of grinder. The next morning, Max and Laura flew back to the U.S. When you landed in Washington, you didn't go home. You went straight to the hospital. And I stayed there for four days, which was hard. Um, my muscles were oh, so unbelievably sore because they were literally stretched from the mob trying to tear my limbs off my body. My joints, every joint in my body was distended. And then the, um, the more intimate um, injuries, the injuries, the tearing inside, um, and the, the mark of their hands, their fingers, all over my body, cuts and everything you could imagine, but no broken bones. Tell me about that moment when you saw your children again. I felt like I'd been given a second chance that I didn't deserve. And I, because I did that to them, I came so close to leaving them, to abandoning them. Do you feel like you're healing now? Oh, definitely. I'm, I'm so much stronger. That night, her attackers faded away into the crowd. It's not likely anyone involved will be brought to justice. We may never know with certainty whether the regime was targeting a reporter or whether it was simply and savagely a criminal mob. It is true that in Egypt in particular, sexual harassment and violence are common. I had no idea how endemic that it is so rife, so widespread, that so many Egyptian men um, admit to sexually harassing women and think it's completely acceptable, in fact, blame the women for it. Why are you telling the story now? One thing that I'm extremely proud of, that I didn't intend, is when um, my female colleagues stood up and said that I'd broken the silence on what all of us have experienced but never talk about. What did they mean by that? That women never complain about um, incidents of sexual violence because you don't want someone to say, well, women shouldn't be out there. But I think there are a lot of women who experience these kind of things as journalists and they don't want it to stop them from doing their job because they do it for the same reasons as me. They're committed to what they do. They're not adrenaline junkies. You know, they're not um, glory hounds. They do it because they believe in, in uh, being journalists. Go to 60minutesovertime.com to hear from Laura Logan how strangers, students, and the president have shown their support. Sponsored by Lyrica.